a notification on your side as well. I did. I did two of them. There we go. All right. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. My name is Trapper Goldsmith, host of the T Rap Show, where we showcase elite athletes and sport individuals with their inspiring stories and rise to glory in their pursuit of everlasting greatness. Before, before turning pro, Warren Ward was regarded as one of the best amateur basketball players to ever play in Canada. Attending the University of Ottawa, he finished his career there as the second all-time leader in points scored for the university. He had three seasons playing in the NBL of Canada as well. He played professionally over in Europe. He also represented Canada at the 2011 Pan Am Games. It's not often you talk about Canadian basketball and not toss the name of Warren Ward around. And if you feel like he has a familiar voice, well, that's probably because post-basketball career, Warren continues to be a part of the game, and he has moved into a very successful role as a broadcaster and analyst for TSN Raptors. So today, he's going to bring that personality that makes him so popular as a broadcaster. We're going to talk basketball, injuries, mental toughness, life after sport, and we might even talk about who the real GOAT is out there. Uh, so tune in. Cameras, lights, action. Let's get into it. Warren, welcome, man. Oh, man, that was a great introduction. Thank you. I felt that. I felt that. All right. So you've been crushing it in your broadcasting role. Talk about how your daily routine now has changed from when you were playing full time. Well, I work out less. (laughs) (laughs) Eat a lot more. Uh, No, I, I try. I tried my best to continue to stay as active as possible just with all the injuries I've had, I got to do that for my body, stretching, working out, running, um, things like that. And then just putting work first. So I, I do have a day job as well. I work for a very great company. Um, I work for retention.com. So we're a new startup, uh, loving my life here. It's amazing. And then at around four or five o'clock, I transition and I turn into a broadcaster and I either head to the Raptors 905 arena, which is in Mississauga, or I walk up the street and I go right down to the Scotiabank arena and I call the game. Sometimes it's like six games in a week and other times now it's like three. And then, you know, we're into playoffs now. So um, things have changed. My time is is of utmost importance because Mm -hmm. I literally have to choose um, what I do. And there's so many things I could do, but now I, I literally have to prioritize. It's not as regimented as it once was where I had practice at 10 practice yeah. at six, and I have time off in between. Now it's, now I have tasks and things I have to get done. And yeah. And then I go forth. It's, it's weird. Hey, like after sport as an athlete, you just, you have your sport and and that's it. And we almost we're a little selfish, a little greedy as, as pro athletes, because you say no a lot. It's like, well, no, I can't. I have practice. No, I can't. We have a game. No, I can't. We're traveling. But then yeah. when you're not, it's like all of this opens up. And and I often call it a um, buffet style. And, and we're yeah. trying a little bit of this and this and this. And uh, our schedules fill up pretty quick. So what do you do? Like, I, I physically, we're not training. But you got to stay up on stats. You got to stay up on kind of news and, and what's happening What do you spend during the day? Like, when do you do that? When do you focus on that side of broadcasting? So if I have, uh, that's first of all, that's a good question. If I have three or four games that week, right, I will go ahead and spend most of my weekends or evenings, the times that I don't have games, I'll be researching for those, you know I mean? For those upcoming games. Yeah. Watch the team play usually the night before. Um, I'm lucky. Like I have, I have access to like, you know, like full games and whatnot that I can watch of any NBA team. So I'll watch the game the night before oh, very cool. quarter, half, whatever. And then I'll compare that to the stats and then I'll, I'll pick and choose what kind of topic I want to discuss. So I'll pick up tendencies. That's really what I look for when I'm, when I'm broadcasting, I'm looking for player tendencies, team tendencies, offensive sets that they run that have been successful. Um, I'm looking for a lot of like, you know, body language things. Cause there's so many things outside of the actual, like there's a game within a game that you're playing Mm -hmm. every night. It's going to be changed. So I'm looking for little things like that, that kind of separate me from other broadcasters. And I I'm, I'm someone who I want to teach basketball when I'm speaking, I want to be able to send someone into a, not like a different place, but I want to send a little bit of a nugget and something that they probably didn't know or didn't see 
and they go and, you know, you know, Google it. And a simple thing would just be, you know, like a negative step, you know, and, and a negative step would be when someone catches the basketball and instead of going, sorry, instead of going forward first, they take a step backwards. So whenever wow. you see someone shot fake, what's, yep. you know, what's the tendency? They step back. Well, that's a negative step. And that that wasted motion is a difference between you potentially scoring and beating your man or, you know, you know, them being able to cover you. So just little things like that. I try and teach and, and look for. I, I swear I just watched the video on <laughs> Kobe talking about that. Yeah. It's like, yeah. And, and as soon as you said negative step, I think it rang a bell. And he was like, when you see someone take that negative step, he's like, I know they're not shooting. He's like, I know they're not going to shoot. So, um, yeah, that's that's interesting. So when it comes to stats, Warren, like when you hear announcers, broadcasters spitting off stats, all you know, do you have like have you already studied that and kind of I'm I'm going to talk about these stats at some point during the game, or or do you have like Google open and you're doing a quick quick search during the game? How does how does that work? I rarely do it during the game. I usually have it all prior to I have all my information that I want to bring up. So I'll look at like what the team does overall. So yeah. tonight we're playing Boston. I know for a fact they're going to be, um, you know, that's going to be a tough one for for us and the Raptors. Like they're, you know, they're playing a, a very good defensive team. Mm. So they're, they're, they have like a, um, like historically good offense in the NBA and a very good defense. So I'm going to look at like their rating and what they do well, whether that's rebounding, whatever the case is. And yeah, and 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 talk about those things. Nice. And kind of what have you learned being in the booth versus on the court about about the game? Um, oh, another good one. Um I think I the main thing I've learned is that you in order to be a very good and effective player, you need to be able to slow the mind, slow the game down in your mind. So when things uh, are happening full speed. You got to be able to slow your mind down and see what's in front of you because that's how basketball is a game of mistakes, right? There's there's turnovers that happen all the time. So a lot of players, when they wonder, like, you know, why a certain guy can't play and, and you know, they got so many talented guys in the NBA. It's well, it's because of those little those those little things separate you from being able to play and not like. How, how well do you see things before they happen, essentially? It's like playing chess, you know? It's like you you got to be able to really slow your mind down and speed your body up and be able to control that on demand. And that's a that's a power, you know? It's a real yes. power. So, it's a superpower. Superpower. So I think those are the probably the biggest thing. And when I was playing, sometimes I'd get so lost in the moment that I wouldn't be able to do that. But now that I sit up above or sit courtside and I watch the game, and someone's dribbling the ball, I can I can see what I would do in those situations before they actually happen. And then mm. when I'm when I'm calling a game, sometimes I'll say something, and it's exactly what, exactly what happens in the next play because I can see it better. You know? Yes. So, um, yeah. They that's call so it, so important. Yeah, they call that feel for the game, but I think that's just a principle and something you can use in life. Like you got to be able to see certain things before they kind of happen and you know, do something about it. Okay. I like that. You you mentioned you had to slow the game down. So what were some kind of techniques or tangibles for our, our younger listeners that you would do when you were playing to, to slow it down and you almost we would call it Zen or hyper-focused yeah. or, but what were some key triggers that you used to get there? Well, as an athlete, I, I didn't do a good job of that. So I, <laughs> I can tell you what, what I would now it's easier because I don't play, but I think probably more importantly, um, one thing you can do is just you got to stay in the moment. You got to You got to Like I, I whenever the game was tight when I was playing, I would think about the glory of, you know, like hitting a game winner you know, or mm -hmm. whatever. I would think about that instead of thinking about what I have to do in the very moment. So um, part of being able to think fast is this may sound weird, but don't think at all. You know, it's right. like you want you want to play off of your instincts um and it, within your instincts you can pick and choose the times where okay this is my time to speed up this is my time to slow down but mm -hmm. you want to be instinctual with your movements and um so that's the way i would do it and then um repetition i think i was a i was a, a repetition person so i had certain moves and certain things that i would be very very good at and very specific at and i would 
play off of, you know, whatever the defense would give me. I was a scorer. So that's how I was able to do it for so long, regardless of injury. Yeah, just completely repetition. I remember my dad always telling me, he's like, Trapper, don't go through the emotion, go through the motion. And, there and, you go. and just there you shut go. this down and just just do it and, exactly. and not think about it. Exactly. That's exactly what uh, that's that's your, your dad's right. You stay out of the emotion. <laughs> and that's what happened to me. Sometimes I'd get a little emotional when it comes to the sport and, you know, in the moment so much that I'd forget about the task at hand, you know. Mm. So coming up, you went to the University of Ottawa. Yep. Now you were touted as a high rank high school player. Was there a decision there to go to uh, Ottawa and, and not down the States? Big time, big time, big time. I mean, my my parents, you know, where they're like, I got to talk about them with this, where they're from. Um, they were like education first. And, mm. you know, I was a late bloomer when it came to that. I started playing at 13. Now, I was a soccer player all before that. So uh, this transition with basketball happened quickly. Uh, I started to grow and started to get pretty good. And um, but I was really skinny. And to be honest, I didn't have the biggest belief in myself at that time to actually go play D1. You know, oh, I, I, interesting. it was an option, but it was like back back in my day, per se, like literally was, Tristan went to the league like well, Tristan was born 92. I'm 89. So that that gap between the 89s and the 92s yeah. after 92, every, everyone started going to the NBA mm. but, you know, prior to that going D1 was like far fetch the the nba was basically like me going to the moon right right and I, it's not yeah. happening you yeah. know what i'm saying and so i didn't really have the support system and the belief that like this shit's possible you know yeah. what i'm saying so um when funny enough four circle it almost happened you know like that's that's why it's even funnier but um yeah i was highly not highly touted but i was one of the most recruited players in high school but um, they were all local universities. I had them all, uh, West, East, everybody basically here. Um, but Ottawa was the one, the only school that was downtown, one of the last schools to call me. And when Dave called me, he sounded like an American. And I was like, I just came back from the States. I had to, if I was going to go, I was going to have to go to a junior college. And yep. that was in Wabash Junior College, which was the border of Indiana and uh, um uh illinois excuse me so right at the border like literally you go one side indiana you go on the other side <laughs> so i was gonna go there for two years and then i wanted my my school was uh i always wanted to play at syracuse i wasn't getting recruited there but indiana university had a lot of interest so i was probably i wanted to go there um so they were like if you come here for two years we could get you into pretty much any d1 school and i was like cool me and my dad flew down. The school looked like it, it looked like an elementary school, essentially. Like it wasn't a university at all. Like school wasn't 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 very serious. The environment wasn't the best. So my family was like, my dad always told me, you know, he's like, if you're good enough, they'll find you. You don't mm -hmm. have to worry about that. You're good mm -hmm. enough, they'll find you. So I said, okay, you know, let's go to a better institution, a school that looked like it was an actual university. Um, let's go to a coach who uh, once I spoke to Dave and we sat down and we talked and Dave came to my house maybe four times to recruit me and my family. Um, my, my family liked him the most. I liked him the most. And um, he was he told me all the things that I had thought about myself that I could be, you know, and I think nice. that's important. You know, when you, yeah. you everyone thinks in their mind and this is where I think doubt comes from, too, is that we we are it's it's one thing to be like who you say you are but it's another thing to hear other people tell you that and give you yeah. the you know the reassurance and he was one of the coaches that really said like no you come here you'll play on team canada you know you you know like you'll have a chance to go in pro I, I can see that i can see it and um i just was like yeah you know this is the spot and at a young age i made the best decision because i was a big fish in a small pond and i didn't realize mm -hmm. that until i was done you know i became a name everywhere because of going there if i did that in the states i don't think it, happened. Yeah. it would never have happened yeah man there's a lot of powerful powerful stuff in there and belief i've always said that like belief is is the number num it's number one 
And sometimes I like how you said that, like you, you had a coach, sometimes we have a coach or, or a parent that we borrow that belief from for a little while until we, we get it in ourselves. One of the, uh, the movie, uh, King Richard and the Williams sisters, like it blew me away as a parent, seeing how early he instilled that they were going to be the greatest early mm -hmm. on. Like it was, he, he told them that every day, every day. And well, guess what? The kids, the kids eventually going to, going to believe that. And, and having okay. that belief is, yeah. So, okay, this is good. So you went to university, you, your career started to really blossom there, but when did you know pro basketball was, was a thing that was the route you were going to take? Uh, I knew that pretty early. I made up my mind. Pretty yep. early. I think I made up my, I was 16 years old and my dad wrote, uh, my dad made me write um, like a letter, not a letter to myself, but a, on a big piece of paper like this, he made me write down, I'm a good basketball player. I'm going to get better and I'm going to be a pro. And I put that on my wall and I read it every day at 16. And then pretty much from right then on, I knew. Um, and then when I got to university, uh, I was the first person in my university to summertime. A lot of the guys would would go home. And I said, no, nah, fuck that. Or no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to stay here. Excuse my language. And then I'm going <laughs> to. It's so gonna good. Go. This is an adult podcast. Okay. It's, I'm raw. Gonna, it's real. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to work out. So I met this guy named Alan Horton and um, he used to come watch us play. And he goes, he goes, I want to train you in the summertime for free. Mm. And we became good, good friends. He's an older gentleman. He was a, a Poliquin specialist. And that's a, I don't know if you know Jim Poliquin, but he's a type of trainer and um, he would follow his routines. He got me some supplements and we worked out twice a day, every single day for the entire summer. And uh, my first year I was, uh, I went to University of Ottawa, buck seventy-five. I came back the next season, one ninety, and I was dominating. Um, all the senior guys were. I was stronger. I was more athletic, and um, I was ready. I was ready to go on. Like after that second year, everyone knew whose team it was. It was me. I was next. There was a guy, Josh Gibson Bascom. He was the reason. One of the reasons why I went there. Six foot four point guard from Toronto, very, very good player. He was the all-time leading scorer in the school until Johnny broke that record. Um, and then, uh, yeah, after my second year, I, I, I knew, I knew I was, there's no one in, no one in Canada who could touch me. And I said, you know, I believe my dad. I said, if I just keep getting better, um, I'm going to, I'm going to have an opportunity to go. And um, because yeah, of just my size and it was, there wasn't too many people in who were doing the things I was doing or could do. So, but I worked, I worked my tail off for it, you know, and I got, I got better. I put a lot of time in and that was the routine every summer. I stayed in Ottawa, mm. I didn't go home. I, I stayed I, and I worked, I had my fun, but I also yeah. worked, I worked. Yeah. I were all day long, you know, like it was a job. I just kept working and working. And uh, I kept getting better. I kept adding layers to my game. And it's like, it's not, I'm, I'm a very, I'm a very firm believer that, um, Majority of people, and especially today, everyone works to some degree. Right. But is the work working for you? That's what yeah. you have to ask yourself. Is what you're what you're working on? Is it working for you? I saw results from what I was doing. I, I wasn't the kind of guy who woke up at six a.m. to go put up jump shots or five hundred jump shots because that shit doesn't matter. It only matters if you make them in a the game. So I woke up at ten and I still did my jump shots. I still did all my work. But then when the game came, I was a gamer. You know. Mm. I'm, I, I I made shots in the game when it actually matters. So yeah. um, all of those things, I, I think, gave me the real confidence I needed. And yeah. That's important because I think being, yeah, and well, I, this is one of the topics I wanted to touch on, you know, going good to, to great, but you really, you almost have to be vulnerable as well and, and put the ego aside and be like, hey, these are my, my weaknesses. If I want to get better, this is what I, I want to get you know, focus on. Yeah. The three pointers are fun, but this is, you know, it's, it's at the key or, um, you know, these are the, what's important to my game that I need to focus on. And, and that goes across any sport, I think. Big time, big time. I agree. So you played in Canada and Europe. What were some big differences between playing professionally in Canada and playing professionally overseas? Um, this is the pace of the game, the intelligence of the game. I think Canada at the time was it's it was it was like it was a developing league, so mm. there was a lot of unprofessionalism in in that. Like the the housing situation is not the same. 
Um, it's a lot of off court stuff is different. Just the some of these teams and leagues have been around for for decades. You know, you got people who played there, you know, like I played in I played in Spain and Paulo Gasol's first professional game was in the same team I played for, you know, so you got you got little things like that. Like these teams have been around for a very, very long time. There's a lot of history and culture and mm. and um, a lot of honor that comes on and playing with some of these teams, even, you know, even having the jersey is a special thing, you know, so um, more so here. It's not the same or the quality of life and the way that the game is is taken and the fans. I mean, you, you know, you go to a you know, you go to a Euro League game. Most of the fans that are sitting in there are all people who play basketball. They're not they're not your casual fan. Like here in Toronto, you go to Raptors game. The fans are like, you know, RBC and you know, <laughs> like other organizations who don't give a shit about basketball. They're just there for the business. But you go to a Euro League game. It's like people are in the stands with you know, flares and flags because yeah. their, you know, their grandfather was the manager of the team or, you know what I mean? It's like, there, there's a, there is some sort of lineage and attachment to the team. So when you play for them, they expect 110% effort and passion um, every game, you know, so big difference. And I think that's not just basketball. That's across the board. Like you yeah. see hockey like that as well. Soccer. Uh, so soccer. I mean, uh, don't even, don't even call it soccer over there. You, you get, get punched. Yeah. yeah football. I, <laughs> exactly. Which is like my favorite sport. So I, I mean, they're, they're, they're insane when it comes to the support. And how do the salaries compare to playing in Canada versus over there as well? Uh, not even close. <laughs> I mean, I, I was lucky because I, I had a name. So I always was able to negotiate not the same amount, but a good amount. Like my first contract overseas, I made 130,000 Canadian. So, uh, nice. and I was 23 years old. That was the most money I had had at the time. So yeah. that was my first deal. Uh, it was good money. The confer- Basically what I, I got paid around like 7,000, 8,000 euros a month, um, sometimes 10. And then when I would convert that, to because you know in Europe there's you know there's also bonuses and stuff too so when I would convert that to Canadian it would basically double so mm-hmm. I would if I'd sent home six thousand it, it was twelve right yeah if I yeah. sent home three it was six so yeah it was oh it was it was it was good money um over there and then here it's like yeah you're you're gonna get by you're gonna have enough but you need to have like like I said, I was lucky when I got here, I already had a name, so they weren't going to pay me what they paid some of the other guys who were getting like 2,500 a month or 3000 a month. Like I was, yeah, I would, I wouldn't, I would never play for that. Right. And so Warren, you had quite a few injuries through your career. How, how hard, how hard is the game of basketball, like the sport of basketball on your body? I mean, you're, yeah. You're running up and down the court. You're jumping at ridiculously heights for for human beings, um, and and then just the roughness of the sport. How how hard is it on the body? Well, obviously, in my situation, uh, a lot of my in- injuries were just freak accidents. I mean, I didn't really find basketball too hard on my body per se, but um, you know, well, that's 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 kind of a big contradiction because of all the surgeries I've had, but. <laughs> Um, most of my injuries were just, like I said, freak accidents. So, um, I think the, the hardest part is this getting up and down the floor when players start doing this a little bit slower now, now jumping becomes harder, but when you can do this and you have speed and momentum and you're running, then everything else is good. So the more injuries I had, I used to do this. The more injuries I had, it just turned to this. Started to- <laughs> exactly. So a little less that's what feeling. hard is the repetition. Like Jordan, you watch Jordan, you watch LeBron, you watch the real greats, Kobe and the great, like them getting up and down the floor was the easiest part. Right. From baseline to baseline, no problem. You can do that for 20 years, 10 years, you'll have a career. Because that's the end of the day, that's what that's what teams are looking for. You got to be able to get up and on the floor, man. And you got to be athletic. So it was hard. Um even after injury, I don't feel like I necessarily lost uh, my game or my inability to score. But the half step, the you know, the quarter step, all that, I I lost that. Mm. I, I lost the ability to get out and really run, and I lost the ability to like I could jump off of two feet, but not as high off of one anymore. And you know, and then the leg that I tore my ACL on first, 
I could jump higher off that leg than I could my other leg, you know? So it was just all of that really affected my movement. And when your movement gets affected, now your game gets affected. And, um, you know, I've had three major surgeries in nine years. So I wasn't able to, every time my career was taken off, I had to go back and like, you know, learn how to walk. (laughs) And then I recovered from that. Like the first one was in university, my fourth year. Had I gone play D1, I would have never, like I would have been done. So I stay, luckily I stayed here. I got a fifth year. Then I entered the draft, which was like, you know what? I'm the third Canadian in history to ever do that or fifth or something like that to ever enter the draft from here, almost get drafted. But because I did five years here, I couldn't. So I had to be a free agent. So that was the um, first, that was the first hurdle of adversity. Then I go play two more years. Uh, I go overseas, Germany, France, come back here, tear my Achilles. Um, and then after the Achilles trap, I was like, you know what? I, I think I'm done. I come mm-hmm. back in six months. I'm jumping again, running again. I win player of the year in Canada. And then I'm like, you know what? Um, oh, and that, yeah, sorry. Then I'm like, you know what? Uh, I'm not done. Let's go back and play again. I keep playing. And then I go to Spain two years later. I'm doing a normal Euro step in January, January 28th, 2018. I get clipped by a big man who clips me on my hip. My knee goes ACL. I walk off the court. And that's the last time I played a professional game. So wow. career just went like this. The whole, you know, all nine, all six years went just went like this. Do you find we talked about belief earlier in the show that every injury you had kind of chipped away at that belief and confidence a little bit, or did you feel like your mental process, you came back stronger? I'd be lying if I said I didn't have any doubt. Mm. Uh, I I didn't, I didn't know what was wrong with me. I thought I had something wrong. Like when you, when you keep getting injured like that and it's, and it just like, you put in all the time, you put in the effort, you do all the work. I was working. I probably worked a lot differently than most athletes, you know, um, cause I was really like, I was really meticulous and smart about it and it keeps happening. You blame yourself. So I was like, I had, I portrayed confidence, but deep down I was, I was a mess. Like I was mm-hmm. no, you know, I just, I kept going because I didn't, it's not that I didn't know anything else. I wasn't ready to be okay. Um, not having that be my identity anymore. Right. I was, I was a lot, I was trapped more so in the identity. And I think that's why I kept getting hurt. Cause I'm like, now I realize I don't need that to be worn. You know, I'm still, mm-hmm. I'm still my, I don't, I don't need yeah. it to be me. I'm still, I can still do everything I wanted to do. And in fact, life has kind of showed me that. So I just had to be patient and be, have the belief to, to see it without seeing it, as I said earlier, to see things yeah. happening and um, all that stuff, you know, it makes me kind of sometimes a little emotional, but I, I you know, it is what it is. Like I played because I was good and I, w- I know I would have had a career and it would have gave me um, the number one thing I was proud of was just being able to show my family the world. You know, my family mm. came out of Germany, never been to Europe before in their life. Wow. You know, um, they pour a lot into me so that I could do that. You know? Yeah, so. absolutely. It's awesome, man. Hey, I appreciate the vulnerability. And that's an important process, I think, for for any athlete to to go through. And appreciate yeah. you sharing that with us. Um, I had Fred Winters, who's um, I would say is the goat of Canadian volleyball on the show, um, a few days ago. And, and he talked to, he had a 15 year professional career in volleyball and he talked about, I asked him, I'm like, what did you do to, to have that length of career? And, and he said one word, he's like, I was just lucky. And, and lucky, you know, I think there's a, there's an element there for, for sure. I mean, of of just being fortunate to, to play a longer career, but also be, you know, lucky that you had the successful career you did as, as well. I mean, despite the injuries, despite, I mean, you've, um, like I said, you can't talk about Canadian basketball without talking about Warren Ward. And that's a pretty, appreciate that. And one of my, one of my best friends actually, um, said something to me and he, you know, every time I was struggling with the injury, injuries he would be like it's the best thing that ever happened to you just have to wait mm-hmm. it's the best thing that isn't just he literally six floors above me he said it's the best thing that ever happened to you just have to wait and you know i started to read a little bit more and yeah it's like you know i, I like i said at the time i was just kind of scared to figure out what 
I would be like and without it. But after a while, you know, besides my family, like I got hurt a couple of weeks before my family was going to come to Spain. So they had to cancel all their flights. And I think that that kind of killed me a bit more. My mom always wanted to go to Spain. Right. So be able to play there. It was like, yeah, I could get to play, but my family gets to come. My, you know, my parents get to see, is it, you know, they pour so much into me. You know what I mean? My sisters get to come and see a different part of the world that they, they have no, like I've gotten to travel only from basketball, not from, right. you know, so it'd be yeah. nice to go ahead and see that, but I wasn't lucky enough to go ahead and do that, but it is, you, 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 you gotta get lucky, man. There's no, there's no rhyme or reason why I've had more, I've had more surgery and more body than some athletes do in their career. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, true. I mean, it's true though. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay, man. Last thing I want to kind of talk about here before we, we get into some fun stuff and, and start comparing some greats. Uh, so you're one of the biggest names in, in Canadian professional basketball. We missed, we missed the NBA sound like by, by a little bit, what, yeah. what would it have taken for you to get there for you have to, to follow the, the Tristan Thompson's and, and those guys that went on to play. Well, I would have had to have a different whole trajectory. I would have had to go from high school to play to play D1, which I didn't do. Um, I would have had to go. Um, okay, so I, that's an important, like that's, I want to just stop you there. So you, do you think that's the path a Canadian basketball player has to take? Like if, if you want to go to the NBA, yeah. They shouldn't, but it is, yeah. Mo- that's why mo- the majority of the Canadians, they didn't play here. They all played D1 somehow. Mm-hmm they went to prep school, whatever, they all played D1 and then they go to the league. I, I I was trying to get it from here. But after four years, your name gets put in the draft. So my draft class was 2012. I entered in 2013. So I was ineligible to be drafted. Gotcha. Right? Yeah. yeah. So. And why do you think, why do you think that is Warren? Like that's the path? Is it just, they put that much more coaching, the level of caliber of ball into D1? Um, I think you just get noticed. I think the caliber is much different, but that's why it's like, that's the, that's the feeder system to the NBA is college. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Canadian, you got to go play there to prove that you're better than the kids that, that are American now in college. And then that that you get selected. They were, everyone was just like the competition I'm playing against wasn't good enough, you know, Mm -hmm. because the competition here, they didn't respect it. Now I get labeled as someone who probably isn't good enough. That's the same way with like playing D1. But like I said, I was a big fish in a small pond. So when I did go down to the States and I did play against those guys and I dominated them, now, you know, like, what can you say, right? It's just yeah. they didn't they don't respect the level of competition. But I don't think I would have been able to do that if I didn't spend the time and build up my confidence here. You know, had I gone totally. D1. You get recruited over every year if you're not if you're not a standout, you know you're fighting for your you know for your spot. So all those things are they play a factor into it. And and winning really becomes a habit and the confidence to it. I mean, if you can dominate here, right, and and or at a high school level, and then you can dominate at a university level. Well, you have that confidence that continues to to carry you. Where if if you're always, you know, top five, top six, I, you know, you just kind of get used to being top five everywhere, everywhere you go. Yeah. And I think the hardest part about being a professional is not like, I, I always thought I was going to get there, but how do you stay? That's, mm. that's one question, right? Like you, 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 all these kids want to go to the NBA and then what? Like, <laughs> that's not the hard part. The hard part is staying in the NBA. The hard yeah. part is knowing that you got the best in the world coming in every single top 60 coming in every, so 60 got to come in, which means 60 got to go. Right. You know and yes. so yep. every year you got to you got to be on your shit and make sure that <laughs> you are one of the people that get to stay. So that's I think that mentally that's that's what's so degrading. You work your whole life to get to this league and then find out that you're not good enough. Right. Like, you know, kind of suck, you know, like, yeah. 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 So that was never my that was never my dream, though. My dream was just to make a shit ton of money playing basketball. That was it. <laughs> where where I did that didn't really matter. Didn't care. Just didn't really care. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you, I'll throw a stat at you here. Has anyone ever gone from the NBL of Canada to the NBA? Uh, CEBL, not the NBL. At least no. I don't think so. No. 
All right. Okay, man. Here's here's where we get to have some fun. Who we're gonna settle this? Warren Ward is gonna settle this for us. Who is the real goat? LeBron, Kobe, <laughs> or Jordan? Um. Well, I mean, I'm biased. Like you see what's on my wall here. I don't. I don't. Uh, He's the, a legend. The real, the real goat is the real goat's Jordan. The real goat's Jordan, though. Um, Jordan is the one who, 13 years number led the league in scoring like six times never lost in the finals the point of the sport is to win it's not for stats mm. so if we're going to talk about who the goat is lebron has never won a championship outside of his super teams great player i think lebron is the best athlete to play basketball but he's not the best basketball player i don't think in 10 years um people will be doing what Le- like lebron's game is based upon athleticism it's not based right. upon like actual skill like, i can turn on a tv and watch people emulate kobe and jordan and their moves because that's that's the game no one can emulate lebron and that's not a knock on lebron that's just his greatness right. but in terms of to say that he's the best basketball player overall without looking at inflated numbers i, I can't i mean if, if you look at if you we're gonna get a little technical here trap but if <laughs> all right let's go if you do the math and look at, let's just say LeBron, MB, the average NBA superstar gets to the free throw line like nine times a game, and yep. can, or maybe six times a game. You you can watch the you can, you know you can watch the replay, and some of those foul calls are not fouls per se, right? Yeah. So let's just say we watch the replay, and someone's going to the line because you know they're a superstar. They get six free throws, just basically just you know just like handed to them. So that's six attempts at the line they didn't earn. So six times 82 games is 492 times 492 by 20. You got 9,840. Now I bet, I bet out of the 38,000 points LeBron has scored, 9,000 or more have come from absolute bullshit. Free throws he didn't earn, points he didn't earn. And that just goes to KD, Devin Booker, Luka Doncic, et cetera, et cetera. And do you know why? Because the NBA is based on entertainment. It's not based mm-hmm. upon actual game. When you see Jordan playing and he's getting beat up and Kobe playing like real basketball where you can actually hand check someone, you mm-hmm. can't touch a guy now. So mm-hmm. maybe my hypothesis is a bit off, but I actually do believe that's why you see all these young players in the NBA. He's, oh, you know what? He's the youngest to score 5,000 points and he's 22 years old. He's the he's the youngest to score, you know, 6,000 points or, two, you know, I mean, 20,000 points. And it's like, He's 32 years old. I'm not taking away from everyone's ability to score. I am saying that it's the scoring and the numbers are influenced. Where at another time, they were more pure, where the the referees didn't influence the number of free throws. Like Lucas scored in 60, 20 rebounds and 15 assists in a game. Like, you know how many points that is? Like if, if, if an assist is worth two points, he just scored, what, 75 points by himself like he he, that's that's nuts but yeah that's the game today so i personally don't think you can be the greatest when there's so many holes and flaws like jordan is unanimously to me the best and kobe second because i feel like uh, the reason why i even i like kobe so much is because he did the most with the least Mm. and that's what i'm that's he has the smallest hands out of you know i mean out of the three of them he's the least athletic out of the three of them um he he was so there's so many other things that i could say that that kobe didn't have working for him and somehow some way his his will his way he's amongst those people and the analysts and the other people will tell you he's not top 10 but they didn't play basketball mm-hmm. you you ask anyone who's actually played anyone who knows anything about the game that actually played the game which is why i do what i do now they'll tell you that he, that he is. And I'm not, I, I don't need people to say that. I know he is, you know, I have the man tattooed on my arm for a reason. You know, <laughs> I, I, I know, but to me, that's, that's, that's what separates those people. It's like, I, I'll watch the game and I'll see people's footwork and it. It's just, just like his, it's, just, you know, and to me that, that is where greatness comes in. Like, what are you playing for? You know, mm-hmm. are, are we playing for, for stats? Are we playing to win? And, um, sometimes even when I played, like I, I didn't always play to necessarily win. I wanted the outcome, but sometimes my individual moments were better. And as I got older, you realize it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is winning. And I think Jordan and Kobe affect winning so much more. Like you look at LeBron's rings, they came at super teams, you know, mm-hmm. they didn't come on his own. He got to the finals 10 times, hats off. I mean, I'm not, I'm not knocking or discrediting that, 
when you say you're the greatest ever, last time I checked, getting to the finals is not it's not a championship. Right. You have to win. Yeah. You have, you you have to. That's that's the point of the sport. You have to yeah. win. So, um, great player, but my order is very simple: it's Jordan, Kobe, Braun, and then everybody else. Well, I would uh, uh, agree with you. I th- and I think Jordan also because of the growth in the game that he influenced. I mean, it's, uh, you read Tim Grover's book, Winning, and he talks about the differences between Kobe and Jordan. I have that and there, yeah. Jordan yeah. literally couldn't go anywhere. Like he he could not go anywhere without being swarmed. Like Kobe, Kobe didn't have that. Jordan's influence, I think, in that era on that on the game, I think, was huge. Yeah. Um, and then Kobe, I mean, you know, uh, will always have a special place in my heart just because um, not only what he did on the course, but also how he, he left us. And but his work ethic, I think, was nice. just n- 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 crazy, crazy. And and I agree with you. LeBron's a freak of nature when it comes to being athleticism. And but yeah, I would put it in the that order. Okay, well, here's here here's question number two. We gotta we're gonna throw at you is the Bulls in their prime with Jordan versus the Lakers in their prime. We'll say with Kobe and Shaq, who NBA Finals, who wins? Oh man, which which um which Chicago team? Like 90, 92, 93 or the one after later on? Well, I'll say later on. I think I think the last three they won. I I feel like they were stronger all around. Uh I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna still go with with um with Jordan. Yeah. With Jordan. I even though Shaq would have a field day, I just think Kobe Kobe wasn't old enough to compete with Jordan at that level. I think Jordan would have gave him fits. Um, mm. but I think the Tony Ku coaches and Scottie Pippen would have also had major influence. But the, it would it'd be close. It'd be four three, maybe four two. It'd be close. It wouldn't be a blow. Like they're not dominating each other. Like Shaq was a problem back, and nobody back, no one in the history of the league could can guard Shaq. Nobody. Can you imagine Rodman Shaq no. though matchup. It'd be, be nuts. It'd, it'd be, be nuts. nuts. Yeah, it'd be nuts. But Shaq is Shaq is Shaq is Shaq. <laughs> yeah. So Warren, what do you feel that great players just do better than everyone else? If you kind of had to pick like a top two things that they do better than everyone else, what is Attention it? Attention to detail. They can mm-hmm. they can separate and see things that other people cannot see or are are unwilling to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, whether that would be spots on the floor or um their their preparation is just different than someone else's and then winning they put they value winning will it winning comes first they they affect winning you know you want to talk about a good player and a great player they affect winning i think that's most important man like there's that's the like outcome that. what are we what are we playing for here like whether that's a card game or anything on a team how well do you affect winning you know I think, I think there's so many um even in a you know organization when talk about like you know like a good employee does your presence and the business do you affect the outcome of the business is, is, is the company making more money because you're just there you know what i mean like you just Love running that. down the floor how do you affect winning what's the outcome here and i think that's what really good players and people do they they affect the, the outcome i love that i wrote that down i like that effect winning so you got a young player who wants to play pro basketball. What's sure. Warren Ward tell him to what path, what advice, what do you tell him to, to get to playing pro ball? Well, the path is going to write itself. I'm, I'm not going to tell him anything. Everyone has their own path of which they're mm-hmm. going to walk, regardless of whether I tell them something or not. So the path is there. They, they have a choice. They made a choice to do something. I'll tell them to be consistent. That's number one. You got to be consistent in your effort. You got to be consistent in um, your attention to the game and how much you pour into the game. Like when I was young, I missed parties to go play outside in my driveway and, um, you know, know, know what you want and also have the confidence. I think if I have children, that's one thing. And my, my children play sports. They're going to be no, no shortage of confidence. You know, I'm going to tell them that they can, you want to play in the NBA? Hmm. No. You can play above the NBA. If there's a league above the NBA, you should be playing in that league. Like, forget the NBA. The NBA is small. You should. They're going to have so much confidence they can think they can play in the moon. 
you know there's a moon on, you know, he's big on the moon yeah. they should, you know they should go play there yeah. uh that 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 type of thing is you got to have the confidence um and then you know, you know and the belief and um also at the same time uh learn you know be be ready to learn you're going to mm. be on a lifelong journey and there's so much stuff i take from basketball and apply to my you know my daily life so be uh be a lifelong learner that's good yeah that's not just basketball that's that's life good advice sir yeah. okay man i, I want to wrap up here and and i want to kind of get into i mean you touched on what you're most proud of with your family and and i appreciate that you you got emotional and, and vulnerable but what are you most proud of what's your most proud accomplishment actually on the court what do you what are you most proud of that stands out um just plan for Canada I think was the number one thing for me it's something mm. I always wanted to do big big dream of mine to have a jersey that said my name my parents my, well my last name and the the maple leaf on the front knowing that there's 12 of us to get to do it you know in the whole country 38 million people 12 of us get to do it so for me to be one of those people and have my name there probably the yeah that's the number one thing I think for me so it's different playing for your country versus playing for money Oh yeah, no, no. I doesn't. There's no amount of you. You, you can't buy that. Can mm. you can you can you can buy your way into a team. You can pay for a tryout if you want to, but you got to be selected to play for for Canada. And I think just having that jersey and and it just yeah, it meant a lot. That was a, I remember the day I called my dad and I told him I was I was running down uh, the street and I was jumping up and down in the air on the phone. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, man. Last question. I, I read this on um, one of, an interview you did, but you said ball is life, but life is not ball. What? Tell me. Tell me what that means. Well, I mean, I'm always gonna have a a place for basketball to be a part of my life, always. You know, mm. but you just realize that there's so much more outside of the sport. Once you just, once you're able to really let it go, like I'm still, I let it go and it's still providing for me. It still provides a life. So life is not ball. Like I don't, I don't need it to feel good about myself. Mm, that's you know, good. Life, life isn't, life isn't like, uh, my life is bigger than, than just basketball. So, you know, like before I think I needed it to, in order to have like, feel like I had purpose, feel like I was important and, all the other insecure stuff that we have, but uh, like, you know, after a while, you just realize like I, it, it'd be nice, but I don't, I don't need it. End of the day, if Jordan stopped dribbling, I'm going to have to, too, you know, like you don't, you don't get to play forever. So it's not, it's not, uh, there's so much more you can do in life. I love that. I love that, man. I, hey, I want to commend you on your career the influence you've had. I, I always love talking to other basketball players and, and your name comes up and, and they just light up um, because you've had such an influence on the game. And I've been forced enough to, to call you a friend for, for quite a while now. And a couple years. Um, yeah, oh, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's good. Yeah. And the seeing what you're doing now, seeing what you're doing now, man, uh, broadcasting and the way you speak with maturity and, and talk about the game and, and still promote the game. I just, yeah, man, I really appreciate you. Uh, thank you, man. It's been a, a pleasure, seriously, knowing you. And we met randomly, and I'm glad we did. I always thought you had the coolest name in the world, <laughs> Trapper Goldsmith. Yeah. So, someone I'll never forget. And you've always been um, very kind and a patient person, you know. So we haven't worked together yet, but I, that day is going to come soon. So um, appreciate that. Thank you very much for having me on your on your podcast. It means a lot. People either remember my name or they remember the hair. One of them stands yeah. up. <laughs> Both. <laughs> okay, Both. brother, I'm going to uh, jump us off live here and then we'll we'll wrap up.